hello, usually at this point, you'd have a moderator that would be introducing me and telling you all about who I am and what I am doing. Our moderator, Judy, was just prepared to do this. And moments ago, a storm in San Diego knocked out her internet connection. So I'll do my best to moderate and do the presentation as well. My name is Ed Baker. I happen to be an OBGYN and a fellow of the American College of OBGYNs. I am Associate Professor of Medicine in um, UC Davis. And my main job and, and where I spend most of my time is that I am Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Roche Molecular um, Diagnostics in Pleasanton, California. I'm calling in from home at this point, and I was given the opportunity to present to this group a little bit about um, a recent update to the ACOG fellows that came out in the form of a practice bulletin. As you can see by the subtitle of my talk, we'll talk quite a bit about the actual bulletin itself and the contents of the bulletin, and we'll do it with a perspective of how this might have an impact on molecular testing and labs. The title of my talk I'm hoping was intriguing enough to draw you in and it will become a little bit more apparent as we move forward, airbrushing the poster child. And by the poster child, we're referring to cervical cancer screening, which many OBGYNs and some even outside of OBGYNs consider the poster child for preventative health methods. So, as we get into the talk, hopefully you'll get a better understanding of why I'm talking about airbrushing the poster child. So before we do this, I wanna talk a little bit about the historical context of cervical cancer screening, what we've been doing for years and even decades and where we might be going. Then we'll talk more specifically about the ACOG practice bulletin. And I also want to touch on clinicians' attitudes what they may be thinking, how they may be adapting and reacting. I will present some data and um, in a couple different areas, one from Kaiser and one more of a survey that may help you understand how clinicians are viewing this and what they may do. And hopefully we can predict a little bit of how they might act and how it might impact you. Um, so for historical context, what we can see here on this slide, and this slide can be very busy if I wanted to put every single development on this slide. I've actually focused a little bit on the beginning of PAP, which began in um, widespread use in the 1950s after a publication by Papa Nicolau in 1949. Actually, Dr. Babs and Dr. Papa Nicolau initially started their work in the 1920s. And um, so if you look back, we have been using PAPs in one form or another for nearly 100 years now. This has been a tremendously successful thing, and we have dramatically reduced rates of cervical cancer. But more recently, starting in the 1990s, there has been more of a flurry of activity. It really got tipped off in the 1970s when Dr. Harold Zurhausen um, hypothesized that HPV was the cause of cervical cancer. And in fact, this hypothesis was proven and he went on to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this work. Then in the 1990s, um, some refinements were made to try to improve upon cytology. Liquid-based cytology was introduced. After that, some other refinements such as computer-assisted reading and um, limitations on Pat on um, lab text and how many they could read have all been introduced in an attempt to improve cytology to the best it can be. Liquid-based cytology was interesting because it gave an opportunity for the specimen also to be tested with a molecular test, an HPV test. And so this was first thought to help us sort out this messy diagnosis of ASCUS, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance a lot of things that we couldn't really classify as normal but didn't clearly look abnormal fell into this category. And because we know that HPV is fundamental to the development of cancer, it was thought that we could use an HPV test on this liquid-based cytology fluid and determine whether HPV is present or not. So that began in 1999 in our country and then eventually we introduced the idea of co-testing alongside um, cytology in 2003. 
the limitations for HPV testing is that for young women between um, before the age of 30, it was thought that the prevalence of HPV might just simply be too high to make this a valuable test. Other ideas formed that might address this, for example, focusing on HPV 16 and 18 to determine those who are at highest risk, as we know that HPV 16 and 18 account for about 70% of the squamous cell cancers and about 80% of the adenocarcinomas. Another thing that has been introduced recently is HPV vaccination. This began um, in the early part of this millennium. And it is thought that over time, as we increase vaccination uptake, that this could radically change how we approach everything because this would actually be prevention rather than detection and early intervention. However, our country has been really slow to adopt this for a variety of reasons, and we're not getting the great vaccination rates that we would like to see. So it could be some time before this could have an impact in this country. If we move to the next slide, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the point here though is that PAP has been the poster child for preventive health for decades, and it has been very successful. Clinicians are, and OBGYNs in particular are very proud, and they have, have felt that the annual PAP smear is fundamental to what they do, and it could drive some of their behaviors. In fact, many of them feel that all of these recent changes are a little bit like what you do with models and magazines. They're just window dressing. And in fact, the airbrushing that happens to them isn't reality and probably isn't helpful. In fact, I would like to show you some data that might convince you that it is not just a simple airbrush job. And in fact, things could be improved by adopting HPV into the primary screening um, role, whether in co-testing or as a standalone test. Where are we going though? As we look at this, we are now starting to figure out how can we manage this? What are the new algorithms we need to do and how might we introduce biomarkers? As I mentioned, HPV has a relatively high prevalence. And so we have to wonder if we might um, be confusing ourselves again by introducing more things. Um, so we need to figure out how to make it efficient and we need to make it simple enough to make it happen. Our current preferred standard for women who are 30 and older is co-testing. And when you use the combination of all the different cytologic readings you can get from the cytology, along with the age of the women being screened, along with the HPV results, and whether they are 16, 18 positive or positive for one of the other genotypes, we end up with 18 different management algorithms. And this is just too complicated for clinicians to really remember. And this might also be driving some of the um, non-compliance with the recommendations. So a simplified strategy could also be very helpful. So now with that historical context, I wanted to introduce to you this ACOG new practice bulletin, which was first published in January of 2016. And in fact, what the ACOG bulletin does and most OBGYNs really do adhere to the recommendations that ACOG gives in practice bulletins. So this has the potential to really impact some clinician behavior. What they did in this was not simply just tell you what the recommendations were, but to go through some context as to why they've made the various recommendations. And they have not made these recommendations in and by themselves. They have paid attention to things that have come from the American Cancer Society, the American Society of uh, Colposcopists and Cytopathologists, as well as the um, American College of Pathology. But before we do this, I want to kind of take on the idea that PAP is, is really as good as we think it is. As a gynecologist growing up in the field, I just felt if I did my annual exam every single year, my woman would never suffer. And it was always clear to me that the women who did get cervical cancer were those who were not participating in screening. It was surprising to us when we saw in 2005 and 2008 these manuscripts that got published. One came from the Kaiser 
um, system, several different Kaisers and in fact a, another um, institution or two was also involved in this study. And they looked through and in Kaiser they have extensive electronic databases and they have a relatively closed systems where patients stay in the system for long term and they get managed with much more uniformity than usually happens in most practices in the United States. So it is a really a nice way to look at how practice might um, make a difference in the United States using this resource. And the Swedish National Registry also collects information over a longitudinal way that, uh, and with a robustness of the collection that you can really look at these things. Both of these institutions looked back through their um, histories and looked for women who had developed cancer, cervical cancer. And the question was, when you look back in these databases, had the women been screened according to guidelines um, or had they not been screened? And why is it that the system failed them? What you do see is exactly what I had learned is that the vast majority of the problem is women just aren't getting screened. In fact, in this case, you see 56% in the Kaiser study and 64% in the Swedish study are um, due to non-screening altogether. So we could try to work on methods to get women into screening, but just using our current program won't probably address this problem. The other issue that remain are the screening just didn't work like it should, or the screening did work and our systems just failed us somehow. So you see cytology detection failure and in both of these experiences, they were looking to see um, cytology specific because that was the norm at the time. And you see that 32% in Kaiser and 24% of the cases of cancer in Sweden were in patients that had been screened according to guidelines, but the screen missed it. This is a significant area for improvement within the lab. And the other area where the labs might have some impact is failure of cytology follow-up um, once you have an abnormal cytology. So approximately 10% of the time, the screen actually identifies correctly that the patient is at risk and needs further work, but something goes wrong. Either the patient just falls out of follow-up and decides not to come, or maybe our information systems aren't communicating well enough. Maybe the clinician didn't know to try to reach out to the patient or otherwise. So this is really pretty important as we start trying to improve to understand where things go wrong. <clears throat> and if we continue to look at where some of the deficits are, we have come to um, think that maybe HPV in the first line might be helpful. And so guidance committees are starting to try to figure out where it fits in. So what you see here is a part of a study that was commissioned by the United States Preventative Task Force Services as they were getting ready to issue their new guidelines in 2011. They reached out to a group in Oregon to conduct a large, um, uh, a large experience of trying to scour the medical literature to find all relevant um, studies where both cytology and HPV were used head to head in various screening studies to identify is sensitivity the same or different when head to head and specificity and other things as well. The request at this point in time by the USPSTF was to, to um, comment on the comparison of the endpoint of SIN2 or greater. And what you see here for cytology in every study that they, that they determined was a relevant study for this exercise every single time cytology had lower sensitivity than HPV DNA testing. If you look at this, the testing for cytology is in the range of 50 to 60% more or less. You do see from study to study some differences, and these differences are driven by study population and by methods that they use to, re to recruit and follow up the patient, how aggressively they ascertain whether the SIN2 was present or not, and also whether or not they corrected for something called verification bias or the verification bias adjustment. It, but when you compare within each study, the, the study groups were likewise comparison. And you can see that on average, there was an increase in sensitivity of 
So if we want to improve upon the sensitivity of cytology, which appears to be less than ideal for screening, for screening, we generally like to start with a very sensitive first line test, and then we will triage those if needed, if the specificity is not high enough. So if we want to improve the sensitivity of cytology, we can take a couple different strategies. The strategy that we've been employing for decades is very frequent cytology. In fact, we have been doing for decades annual cytology and for so long that it has become equivalent with the annual women's healthcare visit. Some women just call it their annual PAP. And we do find that if you do multiple rounds of cytology, you will bump the sensitivity. If you take the first group and you only get 50% sensitivity and send them away and have them come back in a year, now those 50% that you didn't miss catch last time have a 50% chance of being caught this time. So now you're up to 75%. And over several rounds of screening, you can get into the 90% as, um, as we've seen. But recently, the American College of OBGYNs and others has started to advise against annual cytology because the negative aspects of finding these women, bringing them to colposcopy and treating lesions that might resolve on their own may be counterproductive. And that's been a recent change that clinicians are slowly starting to migrate to in some cases. If we look at the natural history of HPV infections, it helps us a little bit. What you see here is HPV we know is fundamental to forming cervical cancer. And if you look for an infected cell, you might have a lot of those, but no real progress to cancer. And if you wait until there is some abnormality, then that's the rationale is you will filter out some of those HPV infections you don't have to worry about. But the problem is, as I showed you a couple slides ago, cytology is being missed in some cases sufficiently enough that cancers are occurring. So one of the things we could do is to look to HPV as a way to extend this since we find it much earlier. At any rate, the natural history of cancer is important as we consider um, these methods and what to do next. And if we look at the, the, the length of time that it takes for us to get to cancer, you see that the vast majority of HPV infections will clear within one year and almost all of them will clear by three years. Those that persist are the ones that we're concerned about. So a persistent infection is something that we need to worry because it can eventually lead to the precancerous lesions such as SIN2 and SIN3 and over the course of time, if those persist long enough, usually in the order of around 10 years, you begin to develop invasive cancer. This is why cytology has worked so well because we have such a large window of opportunity that we can do tests again and again and again. So it is effective at getting the sensitivity of enough, but it could lead to a lot of unnecessary procedures and there could be more efficient ways to do this such as looking at the HPV itself. So what I wanna do is now look at the Kaiser data one more time in a different slice of the data to help us with a construct that may help us think through some of this in risk and timing and how often we might do screening. So what I'm showing you is a study that has over a million women in the Kaiser system between ages 30 and 65, which is the screening window that we do for most women. So you see these women are all screened at Kaiser and they use a three year interval and they use co-testing. And what they did was they wanted to determine if you started with a negative HPV test or a negative PAP test or a negative HPV and PAP together, what is your risk that you will develop these relevant disease endpoints, SIN2, SIN3, or cancer? And they calculated them so we can start making comparisons in head to head and use this information to guide us as we make guidelines decisions. So what I've shown here is over the course of about five years, what happens after a negative cytology? 
So you start with a negative cytology at year zero. And at year one, you see that the risk of developing a SIN3 or greater lesion is 0.07. Many clinicians feel like this is the baseline risk that they should accept since we have for a long time been doing annual cytology and we should not step down from what is the accepted way of doing this over the course of time. 0.07 risk for SIN3+. Plus. Now I am showing you SIN3 plus here because most clinicians and experts in this area believe that this is probably the most reliable um, endpoint to use because it is a little bit less nebulous than SIN2 and it is also far less likely to regress to normal states and more likely to progress to cancer. We don't use cancers for a couple reasons. Number one, we're trying to prevent cancer, not to detect cancer. And number two, cancers are relatively rare in the United States. So the guidance decisions generally are made based on the SIN3 plus endpoint. And because American College of, of OB-GYNs had recently said, maybe the risks of every year cytology is too much, they have advised to move to every two to three years saying that in fact, the risk is only marginally higher with this group but the safety is significantly improved. And so recently the guidelines have adopted that cytology every three years is the recommended option for cervical screening for women 21 and older in the United States. So we start with this as the starting point according to guidelines, except clinicians are used to annual cytology. And so there may be a disconnect between how they view things and how guidelines committees view things. With this context, we'll come back a couple times as we add some layers to here. So the next possibility of improving sensitivity of cytology for a screening is to start with a more sensitive screening test. Or in other words, use an HPV test in the first line, either as a standalone test instead of cytology or as a co-test alongside cytology. And what we do when we look at it in co-testing, now we draw the same line um, that we got from the same data from Kaiser for cytology and we lay on here the co-testing line and you see that co-testing every year is far less um, risky than, and neither of these is very risky, but the, the risk is significantly reduced at baseline. And even at year five, your risk is only 0.11% of developing a SIN3 lesion if you had a baseline negative co-test. This could allow you then to spread the screening and become more efficient and do less follow-up perhaps since you're screening only every five years. And the guidelines committee now recognize this as the preferred option, at least most of the guidelines committees, except the USPSTF, which considers it an equal option to cytology every three years. However, the guidelines do recognize that this is an effective strategy for women 30 and older, but not for women below 30. So here we have the second and the primary recommendation for cervical cancer screening today is that co-testing should be the way that we screen women from um, 30 on and at five-year intervals. Well, clinicians are very, very uncomfortable with the five-year interval, and you even saw in the Kaiser system that they do co-testing every three years. Well, something new happened in, um, uh, recently in 2014. The FDA convened a expert panel to look at an application from Roche for HPV tests in a primary standalone screening role. And the FDA convened a panel of 13 voting experts who were um, OBGYNs, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, and, and very, very knowledgeable in the area of cervical cancer. The FDA allowed them to consider three key questions. Compared to current practices, is primary screening with a COBOS test in the method that they outline at least as safe, at least as effective, and is the balance of safety and effective acceptable? 
And in the panel, there was a 13 to zero vote on each of these questions, all unanimously in favor of allowing cervical cancer to be screened with primary screening as an option. So now we have an FDA approved product, which the FDA went on quickly to approve in the United States, but, but um, screening guidelines that have preferred strategy being co-testing for women 30 and older every five years and cytology for women 21 and older every three years, but no guidance on how do we do the primary screening. So to satisfy this, the um, American College, I'm sorry, the uh, Society of Gynecologic Oncology met to discuss, and I'll get to that in a point. So I got a bit ahead of myself and I apologize. But let's look at this in the context of the Kaiser study that I told you about and where the risk lies when you use HPV as the primary screener. And in the Kaiser system, following a negative HPV result at baseline, you see that the line is slightly higher than co-testing. And in fact, at three years, you have a 0.07 risk compared to a 0.05 risk in co-testing. And both of those are significantly lower than the 0.19 risk that you get with cytology. And so this is one option that clinicians might consider is moving to HPV primary if they don't want to go against the five-year interval for co-testing, but are uncomfortable with a five-year interval. The ACOG bulletin actually advised on a lot of different things. And so I was asked to do a little bit more on some of the other things they advised on. One of the things was the frequency of testing in the general population, which ACOG adopted exactly the same as the other committees. Um, five years co-testing, preferred option, women 30 and older. Three years cytology, women 21 and older. For women 30 and older, it is still an option, just not the preferred option. But for those who have higher risks, HIV infection, immunocompromised, um, diethylstilbestrol exposure, previously treated for abnormal um, histologies of the cervix, all of these ones deserve more aggressive therapy in the new guidance document. And in fact, the recommendation um, for women who are infected with HIV is that we don't hold off until age 21, as is the case for other, um, for the normal woman. We begin soon after sexual activity um, begin. So this you might be screening in some women below the age of 21. And you also continue beyond the age of 65. The methods that recommended for those particularly below 30, again, you would start with cytology, but you wouldn't do it every three years. You would do it annually for three consecutive normal tests and then space out to three year intervals. Co-testing could be used, but should not be used prior to age 30. And the repeat co-test should be in three years rather than five years. So you can understand these patients are at greater risk and probably deserve greater scrutiny. Other key points that were made in the ACOG bulletin that may actually have an impact on the molecular lab. HPV testing should be done with a clinically validated FDA approved test. This is something that has um, been made a real effort on the guidelines committees. There were a lot of lab developed tests that were available, but it is important to consider that we are not just trying to identify HPV infections, but we are trying to identify clinically relevant ones. And in order to do this, you really need to be doing your development with an endpoint of SIN2, SIN3, or greater in mind, rather than simply whether the HPV test um, is positive or negative. Getting too sensitive a test could drive a lot of colposcopies in inappropriate behavior. So the FDA, I'm sorry, ACOG has made a point of this, as have other guideline committees. The ACOG has also made a point that when you do a test, you should use a collection medium that has been approved by the FDA for that particular test. And so sometimes this is not happening in the United States and clinicians, as they get an ACOG bulletin telling them to make this a focus, may start asking specifically about things like this. They also point out that 
um, there is no role for testing for low risk genotypes and testing for these should not be done. Many labs have offered tests for low risk genotypes, but without really medical value. The new technical bulletin specifically advises against this practice. They also advise for women who have been vaccinated, they should continue to be screened. The vaccinations that we've had to date until recently cover two or four of the genotypes and only two of them are high risk genotypes. There is cross coverage to some of the lower, some of the other genotypes, but there are a lot of high risk genotypes that are not covered in the current vaccines. With the new non-ovalent vaccine, and now there is just a very small percentage of uh, genotypes that would not be covered. But for right now, the recommendation is don't pay attention to vaccination status, in part because a patient may say she's been vaccinated, but maybe she's only had one vaccine, or maybe she misunderstood what she was vaccinated for. And then finally, the last of the, guide, of the directions from ACOG is, if you decide you're going to use HPV as a primary standalone screen or the COBOS test, since it is the only FDA approved test, that you should follow what the SGO and ASCCP offered as interim guidance. As I um, got ahead of myself, I started to allude to this fact. After we had the approval and just after we just had a full comprehensive review of the guidelines, SGO and ASCCP recognized that they needed to give some advice to clinicians and they didn't really do a comprehensive review, but simply looked at the literature and gave the following advice. First, how should the algorithm look? You start with an HPV screening test. And if you're negative, which is going to be the case in probably 90% of women or more, you just move on to routine screening. The question that they will address in a few minutes is what is routine screening? And you'll see what they did with this. Second, if you're positive for the highest risk genotypes, HPV 16 or 18, you should go directly to colposcopy. The risk is high enough of finding an advanced lesion that this is warranted at this point. But for the 12 others, then it is a relatively lower risk that you would actually find clinically meaningful histology at colposcopy. So these get sorted with cytology. If there is any abnormality to the cytology, you would go on to do colposcopy. And if the cytology is normal, you still need to remember that this patient has an HPV infection, maybe not with the riskiest of genotypes, but it is there and a persistent infection could be a problem. So the recommendation is to follow up in 12 months. This is a far simpler algorithm than most. And one of the things that may be very attractive about this approach is it's very easy for a clinician to know what to do with each step along the way. Other aspects that SGO and ASCCP recommended in their recommendations was that primary HPV screening could be an alternative to current cervical cancer screening methods because it is at least as effective as the ones that are in place. That it should begin in women 25 and older, which is an opportunity since co-testing begins at 30. And that it should begin three years after the last negative cytology if the woman was screened by cytology prior to the age of 25. So if she had a screen with cytology and was negative at 24, there's no need to screen her with primary screening at age 25. You would wait until 27. You'd also screen no sooner than every three years. And they also made a point that only the FDA approved assay with specific HPV screening indications should be used. And they make the point that it's important that variations um, exist in performance characteristics so it is really important that you do a longitudinal trial to understand what you're going to get. Um, it's advised that clinicians contact their testing laboratory actually to ensure that they are using the HPV assay that is approved for, for the primary screen. And at this time, only the COBOS HPV test is approved for this indication. So clinicians may be calling asking specifically for this test. The cumulative risks um, now, if we look at the other endpoints beyond the SIN3, which is in the middle, you can see that the Kaiser study also looked at SIN2 and they also looked at cancer. So 
what you see here is the same trends apply with slightly different magnitudes. And as you have more and more cases of SIN2 than SIN3, the confidence intervals narrow and cancer has wider confidence intervals. But you see that there's a significant difference between um, a PAP negative and an HPV negative and a co-test negative with HPV negative and co-testing overlapping quite a bit. So what I want to do now is now that we've reviewed what the recommendations are in ACOG, I want to back up to their, recommend, their recognition of the previous guidelines and recognitions before, and we're referring to the 2012 guidelines. This study was commissioned, was done to try to understand US-based primary providers and how likely they adhere to various guidelines and where their adherence um, is lax. They took a survey of US-based primary physicians. They did use obstetricians, gynecologists, family practice, internists, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants, and they randomly selected these from commercially available databases of active licensed practitioners in California. This idea that it is in California is an important thing because what we know from what we know from the um, the adoption of guidelines over the years, California and the Northeast has been more progressive and more likely to follow guidelines and move forward with, um, with new ways of doing things than some of the other parts of the country. So what you would expect is if you compare this to the nation, you might even have better performance in this survey since it is focusing on California clinicians. Each participant was mailed a survey and asked to consider the current published screening guidelines and whether they thought that they were authoritative, reliable, and clinically appropriate. And then they were presented with clinical vignettes to capture their beliefs to see if what they say is how they act. And so what I'm going to do is go through some of these data. I've clustered them up a bit um, and I'll show you how I've clustered them. First, instead of listing each of those those um, practice types, I've listed gynecology versus all, but you could in the, in the reference actually find what do family practitioners specifically do. But since gynecologists do the majority of screening, I thought it was appropriate to look, like, look at this and we can actually then see some numbers. We've also divided between all providers as a whole and providers who specifically said that they consider current guidelines to be reliable and clinically appropriate. Now what I've done is I've taken in a few different slides. This slide focuses on women who are 21 and younger. And the guidelines here is that the first cytology screening should begin at age 21 and not sooner. And that it should be with primary cytology without HPV co-testing. What you see in the green bar is that you see that um, there is relatively okay adherence to this guideline. This is what they should be doing. And you see that gynecologists 73% of the time actually do that. And all clinicians, about 50% of the time, are they doing that? And when you focus on those who believe that the guidelines are reliable, then we've got 89% in the gynecologists and 56% for all others. But what are they doing if they're not doing that? That's in the, in the lines below. Many are performing the first cytology testing before age 21, and some actually are performing cytology and HPV co-testing before the age of 21. Here you see in the all providers, 30%, which is really hard to understand and justify. The gray bar here is in some situations, this might be okay. Perform the first cytology screening with or without co-testing after the age of 21. Perhaps this is a person who has been abstinent and never had intercourse and the doctor believed her and felt like when she entered intercourse, it might be after age of 21. So I haven't completely deemed with that. Now let's look at the next age category, ages 22 to 29, where the guidelines recommend screening should happen only with cytology and every three years. And what you see here is 44% of gynecologists and 30% of all docs um, adhere to this guideline. And there's more adherence among those who consider the guidelines appropriate and reliable, and that's not surprising. 
But what you do see here is still some of these clinicians are doing co-testing every three years rather than five years. Some are doing cytology screening every two years, and you see various permutations of how they're not completely complying. Sometimes you can understand, for example, the co-testing every five years might be a reasonable step down from the guidelines. Let's move now to those that are 30 and older. And what you see here is the recommendation should be primary screening alone every three years or HPV with co-testing every five years. Here you see in all providers, 40% are adhering to these guidelines and 35% of gynecologists are adhering. And if you believe the guidelines, then you're more likely to adhere, but still only 40 and 45% with perfect adherence. So I wanted to understand a little bit more of this and back to this, um, this construct that I've been sharing with you may help a little bit. If you believe that PAP negative um, or the cytology alone is the way to go and you're going to follow guidelines, you have to settle for the 0.19% risk that is associated with SIN3 at three years if you're comfortable with this. Many clinicians may feel I'm not comfortable and the starting point should be 0.07. So then you see a migration possibly to co-testing, but if you're going to do the co-testing, you're still not at that 0.07. So clinicians may opt to co-test at a more frequent interval, or if they really want to adhere to guidelines and feel that they're doing what guidelines say, they can also get there with a primary HPV screening test every three years. So what could this all mean for the molecular labs? And as we wrap up, I'll just briefly say this, and then um, we can move to questions and answers. The first thing I think is that given that there is HPV testing, that we now have guidelines that have preferred co-testing for women rather than just an option, and there is now a primary screening test that would allow you to move to every three years, um, it is likely that more and more clinicians will begin adopting. We do see this anecdotally as we discuss this with, um, with various practitioners across the country and just ask for shows of hands as to who's doing what. We're seeing more and more hands go up for co-testing than we had before. And I expect in your pathology labs, you are seeing this as well. So I think the trend is more and more HPV testing as we move forward. There are now three indications as well. And the other trend that I don't know if you're seeing or not, but based on the guidelines that we saw here today is that clinicians may become more likely to specify the exact HPV tests that they want to use in order to ensure that they are complying with guidelines. So there may be more of a discussion between the clinician and the lab. And I do believe that the lab is in a very good position to help partner and educate the clinicians to practice according to guidelines. So these are where I think things may change. And I think the change is more volume for the lab and possibly more conversation with the clinicians. With that in mind, I think that we are now um, done with the primary part of the discussion and we would be willing to entertain questions if they exist. Do we have our moderator back with us? We apologize for the earlier technical difficulties and would like to recap before we begin the Q&A. As a global leader in healthcare, Roche Diagnostics offers a broad portfolio of tools that help healthcare providers in the early detection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. In molecular diagnostics, Roche Diagnostics is driven by a vision of working with laboratories like yours to improve the medical value you offer in virology, women's health, microbiology, genomics, and oncology. The company continues to meet unmet needs through its investment in research, innovation, and scientific excellence with the goal of supporting your important role in improving patients' lives. To learn more, visit usdiagnostics.roche.com.
To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience any technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button lower left. And I'd like to tell you a little about today's speaker. Ed Baker, MD, is a Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Roche Molecular Solutions. Dr. Baker is a board-certified gynecologist and a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. After completing his specialty training in obstetrics and gynecology, he practiced in the San Francisco Bay Area as a community physician for nearly 10 years. In 2002, he became interested in drug development and took a position with Organon Pharmaceuticals, which was one of the most active companies focused on women's health, and he eventually became the head of the Women's Health Franchise Medical Affairs team. Dr. Baker has been involved in the development and registration of dozens of products for women's health and often lectures and writes on a variety of topics related to women's health. Prior to his current position, he was head of medical affairs at Atelian Pharmaceuticals, a company that focused its efforts on rare diseases. Dr. Baker was attracted to his current position at Roche Molecular Diagnostics because it presents a, presents a great opportunity to help shift a long-standing paradigm in cervical cancer screening. He remains a board-certified OBGYN and holds an appointment as Associate Professor of Medicine in the OBGYN department at UC Davis. So thank you, Dr. Baker, for your presentation. We're ready for Q&A. So a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And Dr. Baker will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question is, let's see, isn't the cause of HPV testing going to significantly increase the number of negative colposcopies? to me Back to me yes here we are i'm trying to get used to this technology here um michael jolly wrote this question isn't the use of hpv testing going to significantly increase the number of negative colposcopies and that's a really good question michael and as we consider um changes we really do need to carefully evaluate questions exactly like this we need to understand the balance of resource and um and the negative implications of what we do as well and it is true that as you have HPV testing going up, you will probably do more colposcopies in general, and as a result, negative colposcopies as well. But we already have more negative colposcopies than positive colposcopies. And the issue is, what is the likelihood to find disease once you do a colposcopy? And so if we do twice as many colposcopies and tw find twice as many disease, that is probably a good balance, even though we're doing more colposcopies, because that's what we're trying to do is find disease. And so if you look at some of the publications that have come out of the Athena trial, Dr. Wright, for example, has published earlier, I think it was at the end of last year, but it was the end of study results. And there's a clinical utility table where you can start looking at comparisons. And what you see there is the clinical utility is actually quite favorable that yes, you will increase the number of colposcopies and you will also substantially increase the number of cases that you find. But if you try to look for a ratio of colposcopies to, that are performed per case you find, the ratio stays roughly the same. I hope that answers your question, Michael. So far, it looks So we just sent out a message reminding you how to ask questions. If you are saving your questions till after the presentation, we'll give you a moment to ask any questions you have. Well, we will carry on, and, and if you do have questions, you, you still are free to submit them. I would like to once again thank Dr. Baker for his presentation. Dr. Baker, do you have any final comments for us today? 
I'm not sure if, oh, here you are. I keep getting fooled with this. I start talking before I actually have control. And I would say that um, I do not have any final comments at this point in time. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to do this presentation and to share with you. I um, recognize that there will be opportunities for people to watch this in the future as well. So thank you for everyone for participating. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. We will also we would also like to thank our sponsor, Roche Diagnostics, for underwriting today's webcast. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. This webcast can be viewed on demand through October 7th, 2016. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.